Hope you're doing well. Uh, any questions on uh, the lab or any of the allocator stuff we've been working on? A reminder that there's this week's quiz is now available on Moodle to 9 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, check in post for lab three. Lots of great discussion uh, already on the form, but if you haven't made a post, uh, make one by 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, agenda for today is going to be to finish with our uh, discussion of this question how do we make malicant free kind of efficient and fast? Uh, set us up for uh, lab four starting Wednesday, uh, and then we'll kind of come back to the question of how do we actually, from the operating system's perspective, manage this scarce resource of, uh, that is memory. So uh, just going to jump right into it, pick up where we left off. Uh, talking about uh, kind of laying out our options for uh, the different aspects of allocator design that we've touched on. So the first is placement policy. Anyone remember what placement policy is? Like what part of the, the allocation is placement policy? Like uh, where you put a new allocation best fit first. Exactly. How do we choose the block where we're going to put uh, and First fit is one option, which says just take the first free block that is big enough for a request. So if someone says malloc and bytes, you start at the beginning of the heap, and then we kind of traverse the heap or look through the heap until we find the first free block that's big enough. Uh, anyone, can anyone remind us how we're traversing the heap? Like how we're going from one free block to the next using the implicit free list farm? Uh, using the header to jump to the next header. Exactly. We use the size of each block, which is stored in the header, to tell us how far away the next block is. And so we're just kind of using the size to jump from block to block, looking for the first free block that's big enough. Make sense? We have a strategy called next fit, which is very similar to first fit, but is instead of always starting at the beginning of the heap with next fit, we sort of pick up where the last place in the heap we made, we placed a block. The idea behind this is using this might tend to spread out the allocation across the heap kind of more evenly rather than having a bunch of stuff packed for the beginning. Uh, and that might lead to better memory utilization. Uh, when people have done experiments and kind of studied, is one of these better than the other? Uh, there was not a clear answer. But sometimes first fit turns out to be more efficient, sometimes next fit does. And last we have best fit. Here we're going to look through our entire heap and choose the smallest free block that fits our request. Uh, if we find one that is kind of exactly the right size, we might be able to stop before searching the whole heap because we can't do better than one that's exactly the right size. What would the trade-off be of something like best fit versus these other two approaches? Yeah, so here we see our kind of 
throughput versus memory utilization trade-off, where we can maybe get more efficient use of memory, but it's going to, going to be slower. Uh, and uh, in the lab specifically, uh, best fit is very unlikely to be enough better on the memory utilization point to sort of make up for how much slower it is. Uh, but if you were in a situation where it was OK to be slower and you just really needed to kind of use memory as efficiently as possible, maybe best fit would be a good choice. Questions on this? Oh, you say that next bit and first bit are essentially the same time and memory uh, I'm saying there's not a there's not clear evidence that one is better than the other in all cases. What they will often not be the same, but which one will be better in a particular situation is like you just have to try it and see. So one aspect of placement policy uh, is. Whether once you identify the block that you're going to use to fulfill a request, whether you should split this or not. Uh, splitting here means taking a larger free block, splitting it into an allocated part and sort of a leftover free part. Uh, let's consider, could there be a situation where the block that we find is bigger than the request, but we would not want to split it into two. Connor? I mean, I guess like if, if the block was only a little bit bigger than the request, then we'd want some room for buffer or, or yeah, not, not, not like buffer, but like, I guess it just doesn't make sense to make just a tiny block. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly the situation that we're considering here, and I want to call your attention to the fact that the design of our implicit free list and really any heap allocation organization is going to impose a minimum block size. Because in our implicit free list, what has to go into a block? On the we mentioned that there is a header that's eight bytes. It's kind of one word of memory. Anything else? Like that? Yeah, and we need some amount of memory for the user for that block to be useful at all. And so I might say. Well, we need at least eight bytes. Uh, we have eight bytes of header and at least eight bytes of payload. So that gives us sort of a minimum block size of 16 bytes. And so we never want to split off something that was smaller than that because we literally cannot use that. Like if we only have eight bytes, it's not enough for a header and a payload. We can't use it just kind of as its own piece of the heap. Angela? Why eight bytes for the payload? Why not? Uh, because of alignment. Uh, because we want blocks kind of aligned usually to multiples of 16 on the heap. Uh, yeah, having uh, payloads that are kind of only five bytes or something, we have to sort of have padding in there to get aligned anyway. Other questions? All right, and. In our implicit tree list, what does splitting mechanically, what does that mean? What do we do to the heap to split a block? John? Do um, change the size and header the first one and then not add a new header pretty much the second one?
Exactly. We would need to kind of change the header, change the size of the original block, and then some number of bytes away from that, write a new header to kind of create that new that new block. That makes sense. All right. So this is all this has all been about allocating blocks on the heap. Let's talk a little bit about freeing blocks. So to change a block from allocated to free, what would we need to do to that block? Rebecca? Um, we would just need to like change the size of the block before it to like account for. Are you are you talking about like merging it with the block yeah. before it? Yeah, let's let's assume that the neighbors of the block for now are, are allocated. Okay. So we just have the block where we're not going to do any sort of combining it. Uh, what would we need to change about the block? Angela? Exactly. So just to turn a block from allocated or free. just need to set this allocated or free bit to zero. And that's the least significant bit in our in our header. So we're just changing one bit to set it to free. Uh, but as Rebecca mentioned, we're not going to just want to free uh, to, to flip this bit and say we're done. We might want to combine this free block with its neighbors if they are also free in order to create one bigger free block, avoid external fragmentation or false fragmentation. Uh, and so I've mentioned the term coalescing or coalesce. That's the term we'll use for kind of merging these adjacent free blocks. And there are two strategies. There's immediate coalescing, which just says as soon as the block is freed, you check if it can be combined with its neighbors, and if it can, you merge them together. This is straightforward. You just kind of do it every time you free. It's constant time. Why would this kind of Co immediate coalescing be a constant time operation. Connor? You just check the things on either side, just like two operations. Exactly. Where, where it's not n blocks we have to check, it's just the previous and the next. Cecilia? Why would you need to keep doing that, though? Because, like, say if we free this one and then the previous and the next, but, like, at least there can never be another one because we would have coalesced this already. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. That if we're coalescing immediately, we know that. It can't be the case that there are two free blocks sitting next to each other, or if there were, it's a bug. So there's no like rules about like if this is a certain size, it needs to be like at a different multiple than if it was in, like that. There's no rules like that. Uh, you're saying are there any rules where we like wouldn't want to combine two? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, yeah. You you'd always want to combine if you can. Um, the alternative. is deferred coalescing, uh, which says it says don't do any coalescing until the point at which you can't find a free block uh, to satisfy a request. And at that time, kind of go through the whole heap and coalesce all the ones you can. Um, this can be the more efficient choice. Any ideas as to why deferring this coalition, co coalescing could be more efficient than just always doing it immediately? Fine. I mean, if you, co if you coalesce it and then you need to break it up again right away, that's a waste of time. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a big part of this. That you might think that it's common for programs, like you're inserting things in a list, and all the things in this list are 
uh, link list nodes or our <coughs> integers or whatever they are. And so you might have a bunch of repeated allocations of the same size and maybe you remove from the list and you free that amount. And so you might have a lot of back and forth with sort of the same size chunks. And sort of at each of these steps, if you're merging and then immediately splitting them up, you're sort of not getting any benefit out of this immediate coalescing. Um, but this means that some allocations may be longer because you have to do this kind of coalescing step. Uh, but the, uh, more commonly, they'll be a little bit more efficient because you won't have to be doing this coalescing, coalescing step. Um, my advice for the lab, implement immediate. It's way simpler. And then if you have time, you can experiment with, with deferred. Any other questions on these? All right, so let's think about a kind of tricky issue that comes up when we're trying to implement coalescing. We have Uh, our three three uh, three blocks here, and we have a header in each one of them, uh, and uh, I'll just use uh, so this one maybe uh, forty bytes, and it's free, so I'm writing kind of forty. I guess I'll use a line for or, 40 or 0, to say that like we have 40 as the size, and we've or that with 0 for this lowest bit, in the case that it's free. Um, if we have 80 and 1, and then uh, 24 and free. So we have, we have two free blocks. We have this allocated one in the middle. And the address that the user has is what I'll call a block pointer, meaning they have the address of the payload of this block, because that's what we want the user uh, reading and writing from, not our important header. And so the user will you know, call free with the pointer that they're using, and then the allocator has to you know, do something with this. Uh, certainly can change this one to a zero. Uh, but then we also want to do, say, immediate coalescing. So just all the information we have is this pointer here and what we have in the header. So how do we go about checking whether we should combine with the, the next block in the heap. PJ? You look at it by four and say if the if the 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 payback is a zero or one. Yeah, and how would we know where to look for that information? It's going to be like 80 bytes after the information. Exactly. The, the size information says 80 bytes away from this header is the header of the next block. So we can just use this size to get you know, to the next block. What about checking the previous block? Oh, the number for the header? Yeah, but how far away is this header? Do we have any way of knowing that? No, because we only know the size of this block, which is 80. And we know that the previous block, you know, the end of it is here. But that doesn't tell us like how big it is or how many bytes we would need to go back to find its header. So one thing we could do is we could go back all the way to the beginning of the heap and iterate through it until we find this block again. And at that point, we will have like saved the information about the previous one. And so we could do this like slow thing if we just look through the whole heap to find it. But if this is like our singly linked list, 
what might be a better way to be able to get a previous block? Charlie? Yeah, have some sort of information that lets us go in both directions. So a nice, uh, not the only possible approach, but a nice A nice approach is one called boundary tags, which just says we're going to have a header. It's going to be the same sort of size and allocated or free that we've been talking about. And we're also now going to have a footer, which will have exactly the same size and allocated or free information. And so we'll have a footer that says 40 and it's free. We'll have a footer that said 80, and we will also change that to be free. And we have a footer over here, which is 24 and free. And so now, given a pointer to this payload here, we know that two words back in memory, and 16 bytes back in memory, we'll find the footer of the previous block, which will tell us whether that block is allocated or free, and also how big it is, which is exactly what we needed to know. Does this make sense? Okay. Wait, so is whether it's free or not not put in the footer? Uh, it is put in the footer. The footer and the header are identical. Then why would we go 40, like, why would we go to the header if we have the information for the footer? Oh, I was saying we could go two words back in memory and find the oh, footer. Okay. Yep, yeah, we would look at the footer. Uh, but, as we'll see, uh, if we wanted to combine these two, or combine these three, that's going to involve changing this header to, to have a new size. Other questions? All right. I want to put up a diagram of... Uh, for kind of the four different cases we need to consider uh, for coalescing. And it's the four that you might expect. Uh, so what, we, what I have here is kind of a, a vertical version of what I was drawing on the board. So we have kind of the block that we are trying to free in the middle here. And this first case is, and the block we're freeing has size n, let me see if I can zoom this in a bit. Uh, the block we're freeing has size n, the block before it, m1, block after it, m2. And if both the previous and next are allocated, we just mark the one that's being freed as free. That's all that needs to change. Uh, second case is the next block is free, but the previous is not. And so for that, we'll take the sizes of the two free blocks, combine them to get a new total size, and update the header and the footer of this new combined block. We do something similar in the case where we have just the previous one freed, uh, free. We again compute, compute the combined size, change the header that's going to be the start of this new block. So note that in this case where the previous one is freed, sort of the start of the block changes. It moves uh, earlier in the heap and change the footer as well. And then we have the uh, 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 bonanza of all the free blocks and we compute kind of the total size of the new free block, the sum of the sizes of all three and change the header at the beginning and the footer at the very end. That makes sense. Any questions on that? Answer. Uh, like all this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So the allocator can just leave them in there because this is the payload of a free block, and we don't care what's in there. Uh, and then when we allocate it, we're also not promising the user that we're initializing it at all. And so we can, uh, can again, just, you know, leave it there. Yeah, and by having this 
size, our sort of implicit free list will sort of skip, kind of treat this all as one block and not try and kind of jump in the middle of it. Other questions? All right. So one sort of other example with kind of a, a header and footer here. Um, let's just shorten this. Uh, so I have here sort of the, the state of a heap as we go from kind of its initial state through a few requests. Uh, and as I mentioned last time, we'll have uh, blocks that are always allocated, that are always at the beginning and end of the heap. Uh, because, well, why would we need something that's always allocated at the beginning and end? If we just kind of had a block at the end, could be allocated or free, uh, what problem might, might result? Carolyn? Would you like go past the heap? Yeah, when we're doing this coalescing, we might look past the end of the heap. And one, we're not supposed to be using that memory. But if we could, we might happen to see a zero in the bit we're looking at and be like, oh, I can coalesce with this chunk of memory that is just not part of the heap that I think uh, I have no way of telling, just given some bytes in memory, like, is this part of the heap or not? So by having something that's always allocated sitting at the beginning and having something that's kind of a, a header that says this is always allocated at the end, we're not going to get into these problems where we're trying to coalesce with stuff past the beginning or end of the heap. So our kind of initial setup is like so. We have uh, our prologue, a header and footer. We have 128 bytes of free block with its header and footer. This size, by the way, would the size of the block include the header and footer? Fine. I would think it would have to because it's the thing that tells you how far to jump. And if it doesn't, then you're going to jump to like the footer. Exactly. So our, our size is one of its important uses, telling us how far away the next block is. That's going to include the header and footer. So it's the total size of the block. Um, so you may be wondering, what is this sort of dark mystery cell at the beginning of the heap? Uh, this is padding for alignment purposes. Because in this particular design, uh, I want the payloads of the blocks to be 16 byte aligned, which means that the address of the payload, meaning this chunk right here, should be a multiple of 16. And I can see that before this, I have a header and then a header and footer. And so it would be kind of 24 bytes in. But if it needs, but I need it to be a multiple of 16, so I want it to be 32 bytes in, so I have this extra padding word, this extra eight bytes at the start of the heap to get the alignment I want. I have a, a malloc 24 comes in. I round up that amount to kind of the nearest multiple of 16 to keep things aligned. So I'm going to treat it like a request for 32. And then I will also add, I'm going to need the extra space for the header and footer. So I have 32 bytes of payload plus 8 header plus 8 footer for a total of 48, which is why this 48 gets allocated. And then I return this pointer A to the payload to the user. Another request comes in, malloc of 36. Uh, that is going to be, again, rounded up. Uh, to uh, uh, um, the uh, kind of multiple of, uh, uh, of 16, which is 48. And then I add 16 bytes for the header 
and footer, which brings me to 64. Um, and the free block that I find is 80. And so if I were to split, I'd have a block of 64 and a block of 16. Would this block of 16 be useful? No, because that's just enough space for a header and footer and no payload. So that's uh, a situation where I would not want to split my minimum block size. Uh, in this case, is going to be 32, as I'll have a header and footer plus 16 bytes of payload. So anything that's less than 32, I wouldn't split off. So I allocate this whole whole business for uh, that request, and then they both get freed using the the steps we were talking about. All right. That would be internal fragmentation, right? Exactly. Yes. This would be an example of internal fragmentation. The user requested 36 bytes. The rounding up to 48, that's some internal fragmentation. And then the decision not to split and include even more in the block, that's also internal fragmentation. Other questions? So <clears throat> these are kind of the, the, the basic issues as far as uh, the implicit free list goes. Uh, so uh, we're going to do some practice with this stuff, and then I'll talk about uh, a more efficient design called an explicit free list. Uh, but before any of that, I want to tell you about the first national park uh, in the United States. Uh, it would be Yellowstone National Park in California. Here's a picture of... Uh, one of its waterfalls. Here's uh, when it eventually shows up. Uh, a nice painting of uh, the park from 1904. It's uh, many pixels, so it uh, it takes a while to show up. Let's see if I can zoom in. You can do it. So very detailed drawing of of the park. Uh, and uh, the park has gone through kind of many different uh, kind of phases in terms of its uses and, and preservation. For example, in uh, the early 20th century, it's very common for tourists to feed the black bears in the park. As you might imagine, there were hundreds of bear attacks a year. That's when you have a bunch of bears hanging out and they think you have food, they will try and get that food. Um, some other major figures in uh, the park's development is uh, this man, John Muir, a uh, famous conservationist. Um, and the Yellowstone was established in 1872 um, uh, under Ulysses S. Grant. But the president who's often most remembered uh, for national parks is Teddy Roosevelt, who kind of established a system of, of national parks and did kind of set aside more land uh, for conservation than all of his predecessors combined. So here is a cartoon of him as, the, as a practical forester. Um, and a lot of this, uh, the kind of nuts and bolts, was done by his Secretary of the Interior, uh, uh, Gifford Pinchot. All right, that's our US history. Let's do some practice. Nope, not this. That one. There we go. So first a bit of review on throughput and memory utilization. Uh, most thinking B, but some for, for others. Uh, please quick discussion with your neighbors why you chose the option you did. All right, so movement toward B, that's excellent. We're going to have this trade-off between the two. Uh, that makes sense? Questions on that? All right, let's look at uh, our placement policies. So I have a heap here. Uh, the gray sections are allocated blocks. The white sections are free blocks. The size, the total size of each block, so this is sort of uh, uh, eliding the detail like headers and footers and whatnot. Uh, so just sort of pretend there aren't, for simplicity, we're going to pretend there aren't headers and footers and just sort of match up uh, sizes of requests with sizes of blocks. 
Uh, and so the question is, which of these four combinations of placement policy and allocation requests would uh, result in kind of the least external fragmentation uh, in the resulting heap? Uh, and for the purposes of next fit, B3 was the most recently fulfilled request. Yeah, so each of these involves two calls to Malik. Kevin? Um, like the request is Malik, right? Yes. All right, some votes for all four options. So please discuss with your neighbor how you thought about what each of these were going to do. All right, looks like it's coming down to B versus C. I think I would go with B on this one, uh, but I am open to, to other arguments. So uh, anyone want to, to make your case for either B or, or C? So I do not have an argument. I do not understand exactly what B is doing. Um, as in what what effect it would have? Okay, first fit Malik 50. So we start at B3, right? And we're like, okay, it doesn't fit there. Let's go up again. Uh, uh, first fit would always start at the at the beginning. Uh, Next fit would be the one that starts sort of where the last allocation left off. Okay. Here. Uh, with Next fit. With C now for the review, next to Malik 30 starting at B3, you would allocate 30 to the space between B3 and B2, and then 50 after B2. And would that not also remove any external fragmentation, but still leave internal fragmentation? Um, yeah, so uh, I don't think that this question is worded as well as I would like. What I was going for was which of these would result in kind of the allocated part of the heap being contiguous and the free part of the heap being contiguous, kind of removing fragmentation in that way. But that, I agree, was not clear from the question, which is why I think kind of both B and C sort of fill in the, the, the gaps in a way that sort of is consistent with what I actually asked. Uh, so main thing is understand what these different placement policies do and how they would affect this picture. Um, any other questions on, on this? On this? Could you briefly define internal versus external fragmentation? Yeah. Sure. So internal fragmentation is part of a heap block that is not being used to meet the user's request. So if we have a block, anything that is uh, bytes we added for alignment or bytes being used for a header and footer or any other metadata, uh, and any extra bytes we included, say, because we didn't want to split off a too small block. So sort of any of this stuff internal to a block that is not being, that, that is not being used by the person who called Malik uh, would be considered internal fragmentation. Uh, so would A also be implicated? Um, yes, yeah, so this is what I was saying about like the way this question is worded is not, okay. is not uh, like all of these, for all of these requests, it is possible to meet the request. Um, so really what I was, had in mind was which of these requests gives you an entirely contiguous allocated part of the heap, and then the free part is separate from that, rather than sort of mixed together. Uh, all right. Just going back to internal and external fragmentation, headers and footers are also a source of internal fragmentation, right? That's right. Um, and so to, to finish with the definition of external, uh, we have external fragmentation, which is like why I'm not really using it uh, well, in this question, we have external fragmentation when we have enough total free space on the heap to meet a request, but it is too split up. Like, it's in pieces that are all too small to meet the request. So if we have 10 32-byte blocks sprinkled throughout the heap, we have 320 bytes of total free space, 
But if we got a request for 64 bytes, we couldn't meet it because there is no single block that is available to meet that request. So the idea of external fragmentation is it's external because it relates to the space, the free space between blocks, and it says that free space is too fragmented to meet some, some requests that we get, which, yes, is not how I'm using it here, uh, which I apologize. Other questions? All right, I have a worksheet that I'd like to spend a bit of time on. So uh, the deal with this worksheet is there, um, oh, I should pull it up on the screen so I can talk about it a bit. So what I have on the worksheet is an excerpt of the starter code that you'll get for lab four, the allocator uh, that you'll be implementing. Uh, and this starter code uh, describes kind of what the header and footer of this allocator looks like, what the structure of the heap looks like with the prologue and the epilogue block as we've discussed today. Um, and then there are a bunch of these pound define uh, uh, things in the code, which are uh, a kind of uh, search and replace functionality. What it says is that in the code, when you compile it, anytime you see p add with kind of two arguments like this, replace it with this code. So it's a way of implementing a function that doesn't actually involve a function call that just sort of replaces some text with other text when you compile the program. Um, so there's a subset of these, they're often called macros um, uh, included here. And then there's a set of four questions about these macros and this information about the heap. So I'd like you to come up and pick up a worksheet and then work with your neighbors to answer those four questions uh, for the next 10 minutes. All right. I, I know folks are still, are still working um, and I, I strongly recommend uh, going through, through this worksheet as well as there will be other sort of uh, preparatory exercises for lab four that I think will sort of set you up for, for good things. Um, but I want to make sure to uh, tell you about one other approach to organizing the heap, uh, and that is the explicit free list as opposed to the implicit free list. So our motivation is that in order to find a free block when we have our implicit free list, we have to search the entire heap, both allocated blocks and free blocks. So we're just going through this implicit free list, header to header to header, uh, looking for one that's both free and big enough for what we need. And uh, if we have a lot of blocks on the heap, and many of them are allocated, we're wasting a lot of time with each request, kind of searching through all these allocated blocks. So our solution is going to be free blocks in a separate linked list. So this is not to say that those free blocks aren't still part of the heap, aren't still you know, next to the other blocks in the heap. It's just in addition to that, we're going to maintain this separate linked list of free blocks so that when we need to find a free block, we can search just the free blocks. And that's going to be kind of much uh, uh, faster and 
lead to a big improvement in throughput over the implicit free list. Fine. So with this linked list, this, so it is explicitly a linked list. I assume that means that it's only carrying the pointers to the because if it if it's carrying all of them, that's going to leave the product. Yeah. So the question is, what, what is how is this linked list actually structured? Where are the like where do we keep this data? Uh, and so in our explicit free list. Our allocated blocks are actually not going to look any different whatsoever They're going to have a header and footer, they're going to have the size, they're going to have a 1 for the allocated or free bit, they're going to have a payload because the only blocks that we need in this linked list are the free blocks. And a useful fact about free blocks is that by definition, no one is using the payload of this block, which means that the allocator can make use of this payload to store information such as next and previous pointers. So in our free block, we're going to have size and free size and free, and then the first eight bytes of the payload will be a pointer to the next free block, and the eight bytes after that in the payload will be the address of the previous free block in our linked list. And so without requiring any extra space on the heap, we're just going to repurpose the payload of free blocks to keep track of this linked list data structure. So one nice thing about this is a lot of the stuff from the implicit free list just works the same. Uh, we're still going to have the same sort of placement. We can have the same sort of placement policy, same sort of splitting, um, uh, same sort of coalescing because when we free a block, we're still going to be looking for its actual neighbors in memory to coalesce with. Um, because an important fact about this free list is that the order of things in the list does not match the order of things in memory. So let me just show you this. So what this means is that our sort of abstract conception of this explicit free list is we have kind of our different free blocks, A, B, and C, with their next and previous pointers. But when we look at the actual like memory in the heap, kind of blocks that are next to it, that are near each other in memory might be at, in different parts of our linked list. So uh, this is just illustrating that like this free block here, maybe its next pointer goes somewhere over here, its previous pointer goes to B, B's next pointer is going to, to C, its previous pointer over here to A. Why? Is there a particular reason for that? Is there a um, as in is there a particular reason we wouldn't organize our free list according to the address of each block? Yeah. So, like, what order is it going to be? Uh, so, a simple thing to do is every time you have a new free block, insert it at the head of the list. So they're just kind of, the free blocks will just appear in kind of whatever order they were inserted in the list, but some will be removed as you uh, satisfy requests. Um, and so once we have this list, we can just look through the, the list when we need a free block. The um, Another important consideration that we need to account for is if we 
have a block that we're freeing, and uh, it has some neighbors that are also free, uh, neighbors in the heap, like next to it in memory. Those neighbors that are free are currently in our free list. But once we combine the newly free block with something that's already in the list, that's going to potentially mess up the list. So the solution is when you want to do this coalescing, you remove the existing free blocks from the free list, combine things together, and then insert the newly coalesced block back into the free list. Fuck. Yes. So it's possible to take other approaches to how you uh, interact with this, this free list. Um, there, it's possible you could get some benefits from keeping this list in like memory order, but uh, I'm not sure that those you'd actually get those in all cases, so just always inserting the head, I think, works well. Right. Um, and the just inserting at the head saves more time than having them in that. For, for coalescing, it's easier to like search through that list till you find ones that are technically beside each other. Than just... uh, so you don't actually need to search the free list when coalescing because you can do exactly what we did in the implicit free list. We still have headers and footers. We can still look at the blocks actually next to us in the heap. Oh. Uh, and coalesce with them. The wrinkle is that we have to, any block that we combine with, we have to first remove it from the list because it's going to get changed. Uh, and we're going to kind of reinsert the combined block into the free list. PJ? Uh, when you go with the free, the free blocks that are less than, like, fewer than 32 uh, That's a great point. This, uh, the explicit free list may change our minimum block size because we need to ensure that every block has space for this next and previous point. So it means that when we're doing an explicit free list, we don't want to ever have a block that has a payload less than 16 because then it wouldn't have space for these pointers. Other questions? All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, I will have office hours tomorrow evening in the lab, uh, and I'll see you Wednesday.